Hi everyone, can you hear me clearly and can you see my screen? I've shared a PDF uh, right now. Can somebody just confirm to me? Hi guys, am I audible? All right, perfect. Uh, then let's start off with CP3. So, of course, CP3, as the name stands, it's for communication practice. So, essentially, this paper is going to be like a test of how well you communicate and how well you filter out technical information for a non technical audience. So, it's also about your ability to filter out data as well as present it in a form that suits a non technical audience. Non technical audience. Uh, could be let's say a policy holder a customer an employee of a pension an employee that is under a pension scheme uh, a prospective investor who's looking to put away his savings in some kind of financial tool so all of these situations would point towards let's say a non technical audience that we might have to address uh, so essentially in today's class we'll just give you a glimpse of what this paper could capture and we'll have a we have a presentation form that will highlight, let's say, the most important elements of the paper, the key focus areas that you need to uh, work on, and just some of the most basic uh, concepts that we have in CP3. Uh, so let's say first discussing the exam paper. So essentially, see, when you get the question paper for CP3, it's essentially broken down into two different sets of information. The first set of information is usually termed as the scenario material. Now, the scenario material is shared with all students uh, around three, three and a half days in advance or three and a half days prior to, let's say, when your exam is scheduled to be. The purpose behind sharing the scenario material, let's say, three days in advance is to essentially allow the candidate to process the information to understand what what is the topic being questioned upon to frame an initial opinion on what could be tested. And it also help you, usually helps you to prepare a lot of your graphs and tables uh, that you might need to present in your main answer. So essentially, once you get the uh, scenario material or the study material, let's say, your main activity or the, your main task is to read the material very thoroughly, go through each and every piece of information that is mentioned, or uh, try to highlight the most important information, try to make either mind maps or footnotes kind of a thing. Whenever you're reading the scenario material, that will really help you simplify the problem at hand, which is to process the volume of data that is given. Now, CP3, unlike other examinations, does not require you to prepare for something that is not mentioned in the scenario material. So in essence, whenever you're writing an answer or whenever you're attempting a CP3 paper, you will never be asked for any any piece of information that is not mentioned either within the scenario material or within the exam question. So anything that you put into the paper directly needs to come in from the material that is provided to you. At no point should you be saying that I ha I know this information from prior studies. That is why I'm using this information to explain a particular pointer or let's say I am aware of a particular effect or a particular impact, and that is why I want to put it in. That is not the correct approach to take in a in CP3 particularly, simply because you only rely upon what pro, what information is provided to you either by IFOA or by II in the respective examinations. So that's about the scenario material or the study material that you receive prior to the exam. Now, once the exam time starts, you will be able to download a main question paper. The main question paper usually will have, let's say, some small snippets of information, not not very uh, not very detailed per se, but it will have certain very particular information that will be required to answer your paper. And the second and the most important bit that the question paper will cover is that it will state directly what is the problem at hand. For example, whether you have to uh, address a policy holder, if you want to address the policy holder, what are the main concerns or what are the main questions the policy holder wants to get answered? If let's say you are addressing the board of directors about a particular change in a company's profits, then you might have to state what have been the change in profits. You might have to give in the most important reasons to explain that profit and hence forward. Uh, going forward, we'll just 
or uh, i'll just further highlight even some of the other case studies that usually prop up in cp3 so uh, i'll just give you a brief glimpse into it of course when we do see when we do practice or when we do study cp3 we'll try to cover almost all of the past papers that are there we'll try to do uh, question solvings will uh, be very holistic in our approach in with respect to past papers as well because studying past papers is kind of the most important uh, let's say tools of most important ways of preparing for cp3 exam uh, so and the last bit on the pattern of cp3 exam is that the exam duration is 3 hours and an additional 5 minutes as usual is given for printing your document and downloading the question paper etc so this is the brief structure of cp3 uh, if anybody has any questions uh, i'll be happy to address them at this point uh, with regards to pattern of cp3 all right seeing no questions i'll move forward so let's say below are some of the objectives let's say that uh, we might be given or we might be required to address let's say in a cp3 style exam so of course the first would be why let's say two different investment funds have different charges or let's say have had different rates of return over a particular period of time and if let's say you are let's say an investment manager or a financial advisor what would be the piece of advice that you would give to a particular company you would give to a particular let's say investor a particular uh individual who's looking to invest some of his savings so those are the key uh aspects that could be challenged then there could be something related to let's say pension schemes wherein uh let's say an employee would want to know what what would be his share of profits what are the returns looking like why has contributions not been as high as he required what are the different types of uh benefits that are available under a particular pension scheme so all of those become on the pension side of it then there can be also let's say some bit of questions uh that analyze let's say membership structures of voluntary organizations uh voluntary organizations again would mostly point towards pension schemes for an actuarial perspective uh, however in rare circumstances it could also point towards how the policy holder base has changed for let's say either a life insurance company or a general insurance company if let's say as a life insurance company i'm seeing premiums are falling or premiums are not increasing at the same rate and what could be the possible reasons for doing so all of those could come in so under cp3 i would essentially state that there are uh, four or five main divisions in terms of how the question could come in the first question could pertain to either general insurance second would be life insurance third pension schemes fourth would be your investment schemes or uh, investment tools etc and the fifth and usually a rarely tested uh, aspect would be determining business profitability why a particular business operation has not been profitable let's say so all of those so these are the main five headings let's say to put it a five main buckets broadly speaking under which questions usually uh do appear under cp3 examination per se now again uh everybody should realize that cp3 is not really a a, a paper that tests your technical knowledge per se it tries to test how well you communicate how well is your uh sentence framing how well is your grammatical uh correction or gram- grammatical presentation how neatly you can prepare a particular document or let's say email response etc so something that you would usually do on a day to day basis during your work is essentially what cp3 would want to do how well you draft let's say a meeting paper how well you draft a research paper let's say so all of those are kind of the bits that are tested now of course when you are looking at something that is a formal document and needs to be presented to an important stakeholder of the organization then of course it is very important that the content you content you prepare or content you presi- uh, present is very crisp and very concise to the point and it should not be uh, very it should not contain a lot of grammatical errors as well so one of the most important uh or one of the most evident errors that i have seen in prior years that students do is that they 
use excessive passive passive voice and a lot of the statements or a lot of the phrases that they do put in into their answer is actually pretty informal in approach uh can anybody tell me uh what could be an informal sentence uh maybe just an example of the top of your mind can anybody give me a let's say way of line that you would never mention in an official email per se anyone any bit any sentence that you might have noticed during your working uh, working career let's say that maybe somebody has shared or your email that you felt that wasn't really suitable for a formal communication anyone no examples it's really important that we try to interact uh yes manan that's right it will be very stupid to sell the info, sell the offices that is correct you can not you can never use this word very stupid in a way the ideal way to frame such a sentence would be that it is the it is incorrect to sell the offices so just a small uh let's say just a very small change of words or a ch change in phrase could have a material impact uh on let's say what your answer looks like or how your sentence looks like uh another word that i recall very strongly is that anyways so people usually use anyways a lot in the sentence anyways this should not impact our profitability anyways this is not material so anyways is also again a very informal word i would say in a way so that is very important that you avoid the use of such words of course when we start attempting papers and start solving papers you will be able to identify a lot of these uh, situations in a much more clear manner uh, then when we talk about sentence structures as well it is very important that we use very short accurate sentences that are devoid of any emotional attachment so there should not be any element of emotional attachment or personal opinion that is being given over here for example from my understanding uh, let's say or from my prior experience this is not happening we should never or uh, try to do something of those sorts we should always stick to factual information that is presented to us either in the scenario material or in the exam paper or we should simply try to exclude that pointer if you are not able to prepare a very short or a very concise uh, formal statement along uh, around it then when we talk about cp3 again something very particular and something that directly ties up to the grammatical errors that we make is that we tend to waffle or we tend to beat around the bush when we are trying to answer our statements so of course in other papers there is some bit of inclination to write as long as answers possible but for cp3 there is a very strong word limit that is presented so usually the range of the word minute word limit is around 850 to 950 words so a general guidance from me would be that stick to 975 to 900 oh, sorry 875 to 900 words when you're writing the answer so if you have to adhere to this uh, word limit it becomes very difficult to stay below it or to stay right at it if you start to beat around the bush in your answers or you do not come up with very simple answers so an example that i have mentioned is it is the author's con conclusion that it is common practice within the retail service industry sector etc so automatically it it is the author's conclusion we you do not need to write uh, over here so the simple statement for this entire paragraph would be that most middle and senior managers in the retail service sector are given company class now if i start writing this as there is a accepted practice within uh, the retail service sector to provide company cars to middle and senior managers hence we as a company also should provide this it is an it is repeating the same pointer but in essence it is not presenting it in the right format so of course you will fetch marks for let's say writing the correct point but you will lose significant marks for presenting it in the wrong format or presenting it in a format that is not as concise or as uh, neat as possible in a way uh, also one of the point also one of the uh, key filters i would say that you can use is 
if a particular piece of information wouldn't be said by you or let's say wouldn't you wouldn't use let's say in any official communication in your working career let's say or in your official work then i would say don't write it or you could exclude it or you could further refine it as well so that is one of the key tools that you need to use uh, then again CP3 can sometimes become very challenging from a time perspective if let's say the information given at hand is very uh, elaborate or is very uh, detailed in a way so in such circumstances it is very essential that you try to save as much time as possible if you feel there is a particular section that you are struggling at move forward come back to it later uh, it is better to complete bits of the paper that you know first rather than be or uh, rather than staying around and losing out on time on a bit that you are not too sure upon so as any paper move forward and come back and again there is also one of the elements of cp3 is that you need to stick to a particular format so i know it sounds very similar to school education wherein your letter had your letters like informal letters formal letters all of those had particular formats in which those need to be written so even as a paper cp3 has particular formats that need to go in so usually the most common uh, requests that come out of question papers is that either you have to draft an email response draft a letter that needs to be sent draft a meeting paper so all of these usually have very particular or very rigid uh, let's say formal uh, or let's say formats in a way that you need to adhere to so for example if you are writing let's say a letter that will be posted to some policy holder or let's say to some company the traditional format of a letter does require you to write the recipient and the sender's address however just to save time and not to get into unnecessary complexities what you can simply do is put in uh, rather than putting in the exact detail address as you would do let's say in a school examination what you would do is simply put in a uh, company's address uh, or let's say address of the sender address of the receiver or the recipient and you will move forward you will not go into framing a you will not go into any situation wherein you will put in a particular location that you are creating or imagining right at the point of exam there are two reasons to do so the first reason is of course you save time by not doing so and the second reason is that you are you might disclose personal information to the examiner you know, that you might not want to for example most of us would be residing in india let's say so at no point should we make it clear or let's say explicitly known that we are a student who is writing an exam from india you just do not want to put yourself in a position where an ifoa comes back to you and says that you have put in some kind of personal reference that allows you to identify let or let's say allows the examiner to identify you as well so avoid all of those uh, situations in your exam all right then this is a very interesting bit uh, i would say of the cp3 exam and i would say one of the most difficult bits that are there so essentially we term certain uh, we let's say we mention certain terms and certain phrases that jargons now what are jargons anybody anybody would like to take a go at what could be a jargon or what could be the meaning of a jargon uh, something that you might have come across in prior studies as well what do we mean by jargons anyone anyone who'd like to take a go at it uh, looking at the slide as well presented on screen nobody uh, manan pushya neha disha yes manan it is a professional or complex term correct so essentially the simplest way to explain a jargon is that it's a technical word or a technical phrase that might be understood by an actuarial by an audience that has an actuarial background but will not be understood by somebody who is from a non actuarial background now to give you a very uh, simple example most of us would have come across the term ibnr or premium rating let's say in our working career either if you are working in pricing if you are working in reserving or in capital very commonly you would have come across this term like premium rating rating factors uh let's say 
return on equity also can be considered as some bit of jargon ipnr ultimate uh, your incurred patterns development factors so all of these are terms that are very common to us or are very normal to us as actuarial students however if you are addressing this answer or this let's say letter or document to somebody who is not from an actuarial background you essentially do not want to put in a word or a phrase that they might not understand so there are two solutions to encounter this problem the first is you either use a similar word that is easily understood by the audience or you try to break down the word in a simpler format or in using a let's say simple line or so so for example if i consider ibnr to be a jargon can somebody tell me what could be a simpler way of explaining what ibnr is within let's say one line or maybe 6 to 7 words around anybody anybody on call who would like to Hello? give me yeah pamza go ahead Hamza, are you there? Anybody else? I think Hamza might have some uh, technical difficulties. Anybody else would like to take a go at how IBNR could be explained, let's say, in a non-technical manner? Anyone on call? I would expect. some or uh, some response on this disha pushya manan neha anyone out of you what could this hint at or what how could you explain this to a non technical audience if let's say you had to explain what is ibnr to your parents how would you do so assuming that your parents are not from let's say an actual background in that case how would you explain nobody uh hamza can you try going now i think you were looking to answer this question uh the ibnr part right yeah yeah yes yeah, so we can uh, basically explain it in such a manner that uh the amounts or the or the accidents that have occurred but it has but the claim amount has not been reported yet to the insurance company correct so you essentially state that these are claims pertaining to events that have already occurred but the policy holder has not yet reported them so so this is how you would explain ipnr now uh let's say something like maybe uh capital requirements how would you break down capital requirements if capital requirement is considered as a jargon how would you let's say break it down for a non technical audience anyone uh yep go ahead hamza i think you unmuted yourself yeah is it in terms of the reserving side like the capital requirements for that anyway it's just to phrase reserving requirement or uh, sorry capital requirement so how would yeah. you like yeah so we can say that uh, the adequate amount of funds required to service a uh, future claims um yep. can yep. be under capital requirements yep or you can mention something around like regulations require insurance companies mm-hmm. to hold a certain amount of fund before they start writing business or once they start writing business so something along those lines is what you need to do now this ability to break down jargons the first skill that you need is to identify whether a particular word is a jargon or not is the most is very crucial and the second ability is to be able to break down jargons into simpler statements or into simpler words is also very important now a word like let's say homogeneous risk groups very simply could be state that individuals or policies that have similar risk profile or let's say has the similar underlying risk to each other that can be a that could be a 
uh, synonym for homogeneous in a way. So these are some of the words that usually come across. So of course, in each of the papers, you will see a different set of words coming across. And over the course of the uh, over the course of our preparation, of course, I will keep giving you inputs as to how I identify jargons in any in uh, let's say any situation. So just giving you one of the hints that I do is. Whenever there is a paper that addresses, let's say, an individual or a policy holder who is not a part of the organization, I would assume that these individuals are my parents or any of my friends who are not from a financial background or not from an actual background. So I would imagine myself telling them these terms and I would just as try to think whether they will understand this or not. If I think that these individuals or let's say my parents or my friends will not understand the term, I would consider them as jargons and I will try to replace them. If I feel that they will be able to understand it, I will uh, go forward and I will not try to break it down further just to save time for myself. So this is a trick that has really proved helpful for me over time. So I would, uh, it would be, uh, it would it might be good enough for you guys to even put it into your preparation i would say so again uh once you have drafted let's say what communication you've prepared on a written basis so you always should review line by line word by word look for grammatical errors look for punctuation errors look for sentence long sentences short sentences sentences that do not add a lot of value all of these need to be uh checked for then again, certain characteristics that your answer should meet is it should meet the requirement of the person you are addressing it to. So, for example, if the policy holder has asked this five question, you should be able to judge that whether our answer has been able to answer those five questions in a satisfactory manner or not. Uh, then again, the second bit is directly on from the jargon bit that I just, that I just explained is that does it follow terms or does it use terms that are easily understood by the other person or the other party? in let's say the communication that we have uh, is the language emotionally neutral in any way so so if our language is not emotionally neutral if let's say we have used a very aggressive voice or if we have used a very defensive voice then in both circumstances we might want to review the type of emotion that you are displaying and we should be very neutral in our approach so just to give you an example so one of the papers in prior years had a case where a particular newspaper article was released in which it essentially stated a lot of negative uh, pointers or let's say negative information about our company as let's say the answer to those so in a way if at any point we used emotion we used a very emotionally aggressive statement that the newspaper article is incorrect that the newspaper article do not have facts to back their claims we essentially are writing it in a form that is not the most efficient way of formally communicating rather what we need to do is counter with fact rather than counter with emotions always remember this if there is if the newspaper article has mentioned that uh the company is not investing in the right assets let's say then you should have the right facts to support it that we have already carried out a uh, xyz regulatory uh review and the regulatory review states that we meet all re requirements that are expected out of an insurance company or an investment company so this becomes a counter by fact rather than a counter by pure emotion or a counter by pure words then again uh when you're responding to a particular query or to a particular problem at hand uh given what answer you're providing to the other person will they be positively impacted or will they be negatively impacted that is or the second way to look at it would be would they have more questions further or have you been able to reduce the number of queries they have or have you been able to close the queries you have if your answer is loop ended or has very open holes uh, that could lead to further questioning or could lead to further reviews and further uh, let's say queries coming in then of course in that case your answer is not holistic in its entirety right now and you might need to either collate more information or be a little bit more uh, direct with facts in a way uh, then again as with any uh, formal bit of communication there should not be any unintended offense and is it appropriately polite so one of the bits that we usually have is when we are requesting data per from a particular person if they have not sent data for within let's say one week so would we write that would we write something like 
we requested data last week and you have not been able to send it yet can you please let us know what is the reason this is very offensive in nature or the other person might not like it coming from us however if we write something like uh can we can you please update can you please give me a small update on uh when the data might come in or can you please let us know uh, any particular issues that are causing a delay these are more polite statements that will uh let's say answer a lot of the uh, or let's say uh create a positive impact upon the recipient and they will be able to uh they will basically have a better image of you or let's say a positive image of you that you are very being very polite and you are being very understanding that they might have certain work situations that is that uh, is causing a particular delay in response let's say so be very careful of these bits as well uh all right then again uh, there are certain let's say if for example there are there is an introduction that needs to be given you might want to if you want to introduce yourself what you would say is which organization do you work for what are what are the roles that you have what is your company about then if you are let's say describing the responsibilities and in that way you would of course want to look at what is what are the work that you do what are the most important bits of responsibility you have so depending upon the paper i would assume you to uh, let's say uh write different pointers or be very specific so don't be very particular about the exact scene scenes and themes mentioned i will take you through these pointers uh much more clearly when the paper is being an answered just realize that when you are asked to introduce yourself you would give a maybe a let's say one or two line introduction about uh let's say i am xyz person working at this company as in xyz role i have been at the company for 5 years let's say and i'm looking for certain answers for this situation so these are usually the ways you would introduce yourself further if you are asking a particular question or if you are looking to get particular answers from the recipient then in that case also you might want to just highlight why do you need a particular uh, information in a way so uh there is another bit in cp3 that deals with making a point accurately and very precisely so if you want to state that let's say equity is a better investment than credit and if you simply state this line you essentially make a statement without any factual uh, backing in a way so the other person might not be able to understand why equities are a better investment than credits in a way what uh what you might need to mention is why in the long term equities will outperform gilts it could be simply due to market perception it could be simply due to let's say circumstances like gilts are more uh in demand so the price is higher equities are less in demand so the price is currently lower however as the economy grows you might expect equities to grow etc so you will also want to fine tune your answer let's say specific to the other person's requirement so this is usually the case in let's say an investor specific requirement so something that you might have seen is there will always be a difference between investment preferences for a young individual or an older age individual or a middle age individual individuals who have different financial responsibilities towards their families towards their education who have different ambitions with respect to comfort spends like let's say travel towards purchasing vehicles towards either purchasing a housing property of their own so of course realize the specifics of the situation and then try to tailor make your situation and fit in facts that are mentioned in a way then again when we are presenting any kind of information it is very important that we present information from the point of view of the reader as well so for example if a shareholder has questioned us why let's say the return on equity has been lower than what it has been in previous years then it might not be a good idea to just simply state what would be the impact on your or what would be the drivers of the company's profit you might also want to let's say state that uh let's say how uh how the uh, shareholders uh share of dividends or let's say shareholders share of profits will be impacted so of course as a company if you are looking to target profits there might be different circumstances that come in either you might have raised a lot of debt which is eating up into your profits you might have made a one one of lump sum uh, contribution let's say for a capital expenditure that is uh 
causing let's say some amount of profits to dwindle so all of these could be particular pointers so now you have to explain that if this capital expenditure was not made your share of dividends would have been this however given that we have made this capital invest capital investment or a capital uh expense in this case profits over the future five years will increase by 20 percent than what it was earlier so over, on a long-term basis you might be gaining now another issue that usually comes up in cp3 is that policy holders pension holders individuals they do not realize all circumstances that positively impact them so for example in the case of pension schemes what could happen is different pension schemes available in the market will have let's say different types of return some pension scheme will offer a death benefit some will offer a retirement benefit some offer a lump sum benefit some offer annuity some offer health insurance as well so contingent so contingent so contingent on how uh so contingent on how your policy is drafted or on how your pension scheme is drafted you might need to highlight by your, what are the main benefits of your pension scheme and what are the main drawbacks of the other pension scheme so you might have to give a uh, one one is to one comparison of the two and state that let's say the other pension scheme might not offer a life insurance policy that is being offered over here uh so all of those could be differences that might be appreciated by the reader or these might be differences that the reader might not have recognized in the very first instance as well so for example in pensions one of the main issues that also comes up is that certain pension schemes give you a fixed annuity certain uh, pension schemes give you an increasing annuity uh certain pension schemes give you bonuses at the end of let's say each x number of months or x number of years so all of these lead to could lead to let's say the same amount of financial benefit on present value term but of course how the policy holder might perceive it could be very different so our duty as let's say answerers or as senders of a response is essentially to state out the facts and to try to calm down the policy holder or try to explain to the policy holder best to our abilities given the facts that we have at hand uh any questions anybody uh anything that you might uh, need some clarification on i know this information might not seem uh, very evident or very intuitive right now but once we solve a couple of papers it will become very clear that uh, how we are looking to let's say address the solution at hand or let's say what how this ties up with how we answer the exam paper in a way any questions anybody uh, any views if not questions uh all right seeing no questions i'll move forward all right then something that again ties up to the emotional angle of how we answer the paper is that uh whenever we are trying to communicate a particular piece of information that might be emotionally sensitive for the reader's point of view we might want to be very careful around high uh uh around how we recall it or how we mention it so for example something that we have simply stated is that if let's say a particular individual has sent us that mortality rates are let's say 10 percent per year and from our analysis we are seeing that mortality rates are not let's say 10 percent it's slightly lower so uh in that case would we mention let's say something like mortality rates are not as high as you suggest it is not really a right tone it is very informal very uh in very informal in its approach and the other person might feel that we are just stating a sentence without factually backing ourselves so in this circumstance can anybody tell me what would be the best way to phrase our response if we want to say that if let's say in the other person's analysis the mortality rate is coming out as 10 percent however in our analysis it is coming out as five percent so if you were in a corporate setup how would you uh mention this to somebody anybody anybody would like to take an initial go at it
Neha, Manan, Disha, looking towards you for an answer now. Hamza has already answered quite a bit, so either the three of one of three of you might want to take a go at it. Um, we could say that according to our analysis, the mortality rates were found out to be this, which differs from yours. Yep, and we could say something that we could say something on the long lines like, I recall that you mentioned that mortality rates have been ten percent uh, from your analysis. However, given the analysis we have done, we expect the mortality rate to be five percent. Can we have a quick discussion, or can you share the model that you have drafted so that we can look at some dissimilarities or some differences between the two and identify potential uh, improvements in the same? So something along these lines. So again. Changing it to a very positive note that we are looking to bridge the difference, or let's say reach a conclusion rather than just trying to raise a query and state that you have not done the right job or you have certain errors in your model. So that is how we usually try to uh, use words very smartly in this kind of a situation. All right. So in CP three, apart from let's say. Uh, Let's say apart from the main answer that we have to draft, there is also another bit that is around maybe twenty marks that is usually questioned. So these twenty marks are usually allocated to what we term as a uh, reflective question in the examination. So what these reflective question intend to do is they try to understand why you have chosen to let's say opt out of presenting particular information. Why have you, let's say, presented a particular style of graphs? What are the main elements that you are wanting to highlight using a particular graph? Examples of jargons that, let's say, we have identified or and we have excluded. So essentially, the question, the the focus or the uh, let's say not the focus, but the main purpose of these reflective style questions is to understand whether or not you under uh, whether or not you have the right approach in. Answering the question. So, for example, the question that is visible on the screen gives two examples on how you up chose appropriate terminology. It explicitly asks you to identify what are the jargons that you saw in the question paper or in the scenario material, and how you have tried to uh, explain the same within the paper, or tried to explain the or uh, explain. Uh, let's say a particular phrase that you feel that a non-technical audience that might not have understood. So, over here, what you would do is. Uh, in line with how we discussed capital requirements, homogeneous, uh, IBNR, you would essentially state out each term, explain that we feel that IBNR is a term that might be usually used by reserving actuaries or let's say uh, capital actuaries rather than individuals working in the finance team. So this could be a particular way of answering the question. So given that we are addressing it to a member of the marketing team slash the finance team, we believe it might, I believe it might be the right approach to explain IBNR just to avoid any uh, disparity in intuitive understanding so that we are not uh, misinterpreted with respect to facts that we are mentioning within the paper. So uh, again, two other jargons that can be visible on the screen is that price elasticity and again concept of profit margin price elasticity is something that is very intuitive to somebody from an actual background to somebody from an economics background but if let's say somebody has come in from an engineering background uh, let's say the policy holder who might not have too much uh, uh, understanding of how economic terms work then in that case price elasticity could be explained how is price price elasticity usually explained it's the impact of a move it's the impact of a change in the price of a good on the volume that is purchased so something along these lines might be used to explain the term price elasticity then again profit margin is also let's say a key concept that individuals might not understand how can profit margin be un uh, understood you can simply state that profit margin is let's say the total profit divided by the cost or by the selling price of a particular or the total selling price of a particular good and that is how we term the profit load or let's say the profit margin as a, whatever you want to mention it as so again another two jargons that you have already identified uh, during this class uh then again there is questions like visual aids like graphs tables that have been used in communication comment your approach on the same so if you have presented a particular piece of information using a pie chart, why have you done so? If you have 
used a bar graph why have you done so if you have used a line chart why you have done so don't worry a lot i will uh, we will explain all of these questions in very detail and of course these this ppt is just to give you an initial glimpse of how the paper looks like i do not expect you to know the answers to any of them or to most of them and this is something that we need to add uh, the, this is basically to identify what are the key questions we might be able to we should be able to answer uh, once we are done with prep or while we are preparing what should be our key focus areas in a way so there can be differences where in particular bits of information or particular data points should be presented as let's see either a table either a line chart either a pie chart either a bar graph there are different factors or different subjective calls that could go into the same so over here your most important a uh, skill set will be to identify which form of a graph will be more suitable whether a particular bit of information is better explained through a graph or through a table and whether such information needs to be presented or not within the scope of the paper that you are writing as well so these are kind of the three broad uh let's say buckets within which this kind of a question can be answered now uh just a general suggestion or a very not just a general suggestion but a very strict suggestion from my side would be that wherever you put in a cp3 whenever you write a cp3 answer always have a minimum of one graph and one tabular style data to support whatever information you are mentioning two reasons it helps you answer such questions in the reflective questions and there are usually five marks allocated towards graphical presentation of data that deals with graphs and tables so five marks is usually a very easy score in the paper so never miss out on this five marks of uh, that are easily available to you as a student so be very careful that always always try to include graphs always try to include tables present to present them very clearly add in borders add in access labels access titles graph headings graph titles put in a short analysis of the graph or the table right below it and you'll be good to go very easy five marks in your bag then again one of the other reflective questions that could be mentioned is which information or data will we leave out of a letter given to a particular individual let's say so as i have already mentioned cp3 is filtering out a large number set of data or a large set of information and presenting it in a very concise manner now of course when you're trying to prepare a concise answer or a concise response you you will, you will not be able to put in all information that is presented to you so it is very important that you recognize which bit of information is redundant to the question at hand which bit of information is very important to the question at hand so dependent on that you basically draft your answer and once you've drafted your answer if a particular question like this comes up uh you will have to explain your rationale or your thought very clearly as to why you think this question can this particular data can be excluded now one of the reasons why a data could simply be excluded is that it might be too elaborate or too complex for an individual to understand the other way would be that if you put in this data you might answer a particular query but once you present a particular data you might receive another two or three queries that you did not intend to uh, ask or did not intend the policy holder to ask you so in, in both cases you actually have to explain the subjective call that you have taken in then again there are also certain general pointers that could go in over here uh, there is an unnecessary level of detail that is not required so more granular your answer more could be the distraction that could be offered to the policy holder and if let's say you're presenting two gran granular a uh, data there might be situations in which uh, you miss the entire point or you or you are not writing a uh, answer in the right format or in the right way as well so be very careful of that then there are certain bits of information that that are only suitable for a very technical audience so not required again to put in when you're uh, answering to a non technical audience uh and then there are certain informations that do not necessarily explain any of the questions or do not directly answer any of the queries at hand so simple very easy call exclude them all right any questions anyone uh up till now we'll go into the marking pattern i'll just try to give you a brief description of how the marking pattern works out before that any questions 
any views any challenges that you want to offer to me i'll be happy to address them right now any query is anyone if not we'll move into the marking structure and we'll try to answer the same all right seeing no queries so let's move to the marking structure so essentially the marking structure is going to change slightly going forward uh this is essentially the marking structure used up till the april 23 exam in the september 23 attempt onwards the marking pattern is going to change slightly how it is going to change is that reflective questions that are the bottom most aspect over here something that we just discussed uh, prior to the slide this will increase in uh, allocation to 20 marks and i expect some amount of marks to be cut out from planning and presentation heading and from the content bit to uh, allow for this rise in uh, allocation to reflective questions all right so now let's talk about uh, the different headings so the first would be a uh, proper range of words so again very strict allocation on this is that the proper range of words should be adhered to so so if let's say you have the question paper suggest to you that you have to present in 800 to 900 words then always try to come up with an estimate of the middle uh, and you will be able to uh, answer the question in the right amount of words so something i usually stress upon is 8 875 is usually the right a uh, word limit to start off your understanding with and either try to be within the range of 850 to 900 words it's the most safe uh bet that you can take to get full marks now when we talk about a uh, proper range of words it could also let's say it also refers to let's say the number of sections you could describe so marks could be allocated for that as well now the second bit that contains 3 marks or around 2 to 3 marks would be the format of the paper something i mentioned is that if let's say you are drafting an email if you are drafting a letter if you are drafting a meeting paper if you are drafting a research paper all of those have usually different formats for each of them so if you have the right format if you have given in the right heading so you should be pretty good to go i would say then 12 marks very very important for planning and presentation it's essentially how you group ideas and make sections so once we start solving papers you would realize that cp3 essentially relies upon you constructing three or five sections in a way the first section is usually an introduction the last section is usually a conclusion or a closing remark in a way and in the middle you would have different uh let's say sections that explain different queries that a policy holder might have so for example if a policy holder has come up to you with three questions then section 2 section 3 section 4 usually will deal and answer each of these questions in a, in its absolution and at no point should you answer sec question 1 in question 2 section question 2 in question 1 section follow the right order of points as well and you will easily get these marks then another very important uh, concept that is present in cp3 is that there should be a logical flow of pointers so for example when we used to write uh when we used to write either let's say a cp1 paper or let's say a specialization paper or even some uh practical uh, sorry not practical even a question even let's say your cncs series or a cb series paper you would not be challenged upon the order in which you have mentioned points as long as you mention the correct point you fetch marks in cp3 a very important tool is that you present information with the right flow and with the right logical order in a way so one of the main uh, errors that individuals make is that they present information in a very scattered manner your information should be very clear very concise and kept to the right order in a usually so in any circumstance i will point this out when we solve a paper what is the correct order and what is the incorrect order of points so be very particular that your information or your answer does not seems too scattered when you are reading it or when you are reviewing it then again as you have mentioned that we need to prepare 3 to 5 sections each of these sections need does require to have a short heading now what could be the short heading it's usually let's say introduction uh, review of let's say profits reasons for change in profit a uh, future out 
outlook of future expectation of profit so these could be possible short headings that you can put into your paper very important that headings are usually between 2 to 5 words and not longer then again as i have already described like sentences should be kept brief so usually if you have mentioned let's say no long sentences in a paper you will fetch two out of two if you have mentioned one long sentence you will get one mark and if you have used two or more long sentences you will not score any marks on this particular uh header or let's say this particular bucket so very important and a most important tool i believe is to avoid the use of conjunctions stuff like and or with that then all of these tend to be words that lead to longer sentences if at any point you feel that a sentence is long is borderline long my suggestion break it down into two parts uh then again i have already mentioned the charts bit the format of the visual aids what is the choice of bar chart whether the choice of bar chart has been made a uh, pie chart a uh, line chart has been made uh whether the visual aids are simple and are clearly understood by the audience again very important then there are also certain marks available for overall language this is also with respect to whether there are massive grammatical errors whether there are emotional languages that are used whether certain phrases are incorrectly quoted or are very informal in its approach so all of these lead to very severe negative markings as we go along i will keep addressing these uh, marking styles while solving a paper so essentially even when we go through paper solving and uh, let's say reviewing some of the draft answers that you might have prepared i will always i will not just tell you why you have gone wrong i will also es- explicitly mention where you will lose marks so this will also allow you to come up with your own understanding of where could i go wrong or where could you go wrong as let's say a ex uh, a student in a way over here then absence of jargon very clear if there are no jargons four marks if you have used one jargon two marks if you have used two or more jargon zero marks it's as simple as that there is no there is no subjectivity over here it is a bang on straight forward use two or more jargons you lose all four marks in entirety use one jargon you lose two marks in entirety so and these are marks that are usually very easy to score uh marks on let's say the range of words the format of the answer let's say sentence is being kept brief using the right number of sections and the right headings for each section visual aids uh, absence of jargons superfluous accuracy of number will essentially deal with if for example the data presented to you has two decimal or four decimal places then will you present it in the format that it has been given essentially no you are expected to round off numbers up to the whole number or at max if you have let's say very sensitive information you might want to present let's say it up to two decimal places so if let's say there is a data point like let's say profit is profit for the year has been 9.60% then it is fine however if at any point it is stating that prof uh, let's say sales has declined by 39.28% then the right way to term it would be that sales have declined by about 40% on a year on year basis that is how we mention a superfluous accuracy of numbers if for example we have been given that sales has been 39 million 200 and uh, let's say 13 uh, let's say i'll put in a random figure in the chat box let me know how you would present this in your paper how would you present this in your paper if this pertains to the volume of sales or the quantum of sales that you have made in the exams or oh, sorry that is given as the data point how would you state it in the exam anyone i have put in a figure in the chat box anybody very simple maybe we can uh... So just around thirty nine million. Yep, you could either state thirty nine million, or the best case would be that sales have been just under forty million. So usually, if let's say you have the choice between using thirty nine or forty million, you just present forty million. So try to think it from your uh, you as a reader as well. If you are reading an article that is stating thirty nine million, somewhere it is stating forty million, somewhere it is stating twenty eight million. It's of course essentially 
better if you go either in multiples of 5 or in multiples of 10 usually so best approach to use in certain situations if for example there has been sales around 37.8 million the better approach would be to say sales around that sales around the range of 35 to 40 million or sales around just under 40 million as well suits well in these circumstances also so use this kind of an approach and don't go too accurate while stating or presenting numbers then again a very important area is absence of irrelevant pointers so when you when we say that absence of irrelevant pointers it essentially deals with facts or data points that you did not need to mention to explain a particular point so if let's say you mention one irrelevant point you are penalized two marks if you mention two or more irrelevant points you are penalized all the three marks so that becomes a very important metric at hand now uh, again coming back to the overall language with apologies i missed out on just one bit that i should have mentioned over there it would be that if let's say there is one entire section that needs to be uh, reviewed or edited within your answer or the examiner feels that an entire section needs to be changed then you could end up on 3 to 4 marks in entirety over there or in the overall language bit so that is how the overall language bit is determined article error spelling punctuation all of these very very important do not make any grammatical errors spelling errors punctuation errors or uh, very 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 important uh from a presentation perspective uh then usually there is this one mark uh presented to for the closing remarks essentially if let's say you are answering any queries of a policy holder or a board of director member or let's say an auditor or any investor you essentially should be stating one line that if you have any queries please reach out at the below email please reach out to me further i'll be happy to address it if you would like to have a short meeting or a short call i'll be happy to have the same with you to explain any further queries that you might have it essentially trying to end the answer on a positive note very strictly always put an offer to help in the end one mark in the back now the content the 30 mark 39 marks of content slightly difficult to give you a breakdown upon so essentially when we mentioned that grouping of ideas and the sections bit that you have to create three to five sections usually the marking scheme will have pointers defined for each of these sections that should have been mentioned the most important pointers will carry one mark each so in case you mention that particular pointer you score one mark in case you miss out you score zero on the minor pointers that are not as evident or that are not as important as the other ones you will score around half a mark for each relevant pointer so very important that you score at least around 20 to 25 marks out of this 39 usually this 39 marks is the most most difficult uh area to score on because it is very difficult to understand which kind of information needs to be mentioned in which section and even if you mention let's say a particular point of within your answer but it is stated in the wrong section you are more likely than not to lose out on the marks on offer for that particular point of so again from personal experience it is very very difficult to score even let's say 20 22 marks in the content section and that is why i stress upon the fact on why you need to score the easily available marks which are your overall language jargon superfluous accuracy irrelevant pointers grammatical errors uh, range of words all of these are the easier bits to score on and if you have been able to score let's say 90 to 100% of marks on those sections automatically you only require to score let's say 12 to 15 marks within the content section and you will be get an easy easy pass so again very important that you try to maximize the content marks on content but i will also warn you that it is very very it is the most difficult area to score up score upon in a way all right the final bit that is tested or that is marked upon is that does the overall answer uh, the, or does your overall paper or response answer all the queries at hand so usually it is broken down into three broad buckets it is satisfactory and the policy holder will understand all the responses fetches you 5 marks there is some information that could have been added and there is partial understanding 3 marks and the paper does not answer the question at hand and it is it requires significant read aftering so in that case you score 0 out of 5 marks so usually it is pretty easy to score 3 out of 5 marks because you are essentially able to put in a most of the information that you have in hand so 
that's how the meeting objectives so meeting objectives is like objectives of the question paper or uh, in a way over here any questions on the marking pattern anybody uh, i know it might be a lot of information uh, it might be a lot of information to process uh, in one go but do let me know if you have any queries uh, around this any queries any kind of headings that you might want me to re-explain or restate over here uh no queries pretty shocking uh i know this is slightly uh a theoretical class ex me explaining from a pdf format how cp3 works some of you might be already aware of it but it's important that i give you an initial base from which we can build upon in the coming days uh any questions no questions neha manan disha hamza yeah actually i had a question yeah um, go ahead regarding the charts with so the data yeah. that we used to prepare the chart will it be given by the uh, institute yes yes at again restating if something is not mentioned in the scenario material or the question paper you do not put it into the paper as simple as that there is no other hard and fast rule there is just one rule you follow with respect to data you use if it is in the scenario material you can use it if it is in this question paper you can use it but if it is not you do not go to a third party software you do not google for additional data you do not google for additional percentages facts that can back your answer you never do that for a cp3 paper you can do that for other papers while you're preparing but not for cp3 at all so your effort to find out more data will actually end up getting negatively marked over here so be very careful around this so like for example if they don't give us the data um how will we then prepare the charts because specifically we have 5 marks for the charts only don't worry uh, if you see any scenario material or question paper it has ample information to present multiple charts and mm -hmm. you will never be at a position wherein you do not have data to present a chart your problem will always be that there is so much data what do i present what all do i present that is the main difficulty you will have uh, if you look at any scenario material from the past year you will never ever have this query that there is insufficient data to present a chart okay any questions anybody else uh, i'll be happy to take them at this point we just have i think a couple of short slides to go all right seeing no other questions uh just a very brief checklist introduction put in the names address date uh put in where which office you work from put in a salutation set the right tone that what is your question trying to answer or what is your uh, let's say or what your paper is essentially aimed at so essentially try to state uh anything of that sort uh so a sentence is essentially a short line that states a key a uh, statement or a key uh let's say fact that you are trying to explain so for example uh there are two uh, i'll not go into too much complex so if let's say the policy holder has question that profits sorry not a policy holder a shareholder has question that profits have been 6% whereas in the previous year it was 8% simple approach so your assessment is essentially that in the below paper we have tried to explain different pointers or different reason as to why we have seen a slight decrease in profits that is it that is your assessment uh signpost is essentially to state that uh in the introduction when we put in signpost it is essentially in the thought in the lines of that section 1 tries to explain or give you a brief description of the economic circumstances that surround the business operations in the last one year section 2 tries to look at the particular reasons specific to the company why we have uh, let's say seen a loss in profits and section 3 tries to look at certain reflective measures or certain remedial actions that we have implemented within the organization to uh, restore profits to their original level so signpost is essentially telling you what is coming what is going to come in the paper or at what points are these particular bits of information presented to you then within structure correct format you have clear demarcation the sections you have put in headings graphs have been putting 
the logical structure seems right for example even so even when i mentioned this current current sex split of sections that the first bit is why has profits why has how the economy has looked in general or how the industry has performed in general second section would be what are the particular reasons for the company that they have seen a loss in profits third would be the remedial actions or what has been the most recent experience in the new financial year that we are going to anticipate or what has been the planned profits in the current year so along with that you essentially look at the logical structure within each sections and at the overall paper level as well you look at whether the length of the paper is right from a word count level one error that usually students do is that they look at the word count for question 1 and question 2 together you are only concerned with the length of question 1 which is the main answer that you are drafting for 80 marks and reflective questions do not go into this uh, word count limit so be very careful of that in terms of content whether you have included all key concepts and objectives have been answered there are no irrelevant information mentioned uh, numerical information presented in the right manner tailored to the requirements of the recipient both from a technical perspective and both from a subjective perspective language no jargons uh, simple language words should not be too complex descriptions should have very simple concepts technical terms if quoted should have a sentence following it to explain the uh, explain let's say the term uh, sentence and paragraph should be very well presented should be very appealing to the eye the length should be either very similar or should uh, or should be around the same length mostly conclusion you summarize the most key information you present no further information you offer help as i mentioned that we can hop on a call to explain any further queries you have and you given a closing remark that regards uh, xyz regards xyz reserving actuary at this regards xyz pricing actuary reserve, regards investment manager at let's say xyz capital manager company so all of those things can come in uh this is just a very simple uh very simple breakdown of uh how a letter could be presented a format in a way so don't look at it too detailed uh we'll cover this in one of the papers uh when we do the uh mock exams or let's say when we do paper solving in a way so we'll cover this at that point of time all right uh that's kind of it uh, from my end for what i had planned for this class just to give you guys a brief insight into how cp3 would work out and how on how the paper is stru- structured so going forward we'll essentially first try to solve one paper within classes we might take in a couple of classes uh to let's say solve a particular paper post that what we'll do is each week i'll give you one i'll give you the exam paper of one term or one past paper that you will need to work on and you will have to prepare or present a draft solution and in the class we'll essentially try to discuss each of your solutions and see what are the errors that you have made and what are the improvements that could be made so we'll try to be very uh, open minded we'll try to be very communicative we'll try to keep it from a discussion point of view and i'll and my main duty post we solve a paper in class is that whatever solutions you are drafting my target will be that you are able to identify first the mistakes you are making second how can you rectify them and third would be what are the what is the direct impact on marks that you can score on those so this is how the cp3 preparation will work out over the coming months uh, so for next week ideally for next sunday we'll essentially be solving one of the papers in uh, class we will let you know which term we are going to solve in class and once before you enter into the class i would expect all of you to have gone through either the question pa- sorry have to have gone through the question paper as well as the scenario material and to have a basic understanding of what the paper looks like simply because it will really quicken up quicken up our process and will help you understand much more quicker as to how i frame or how i draft my answers in a way uh i hope everybody is comfortable with this format any queries uh, please let me know uh any questions on the ppt that you have you will find this ppt within the file link mentioned in the group description so if you want to refer to this as any point uh please feel free to do so uh any questions i'll be on call for a couple of minutes more uh in case you do not have questions please feel free to dial off 
Thank you so much for joining in. Good afternoon, everyone. Have a great day ahead. Thank you. Bye.